The first reading today comes from the second chapter of the book of Acts, beginning at the 14th verse. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The epistle today comes from the first chapter of First Peter, beginning at the 17th verse. If you call on him as father who judges impartially, According to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincerely brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, it's designed that we should do our gospel reading from Luke 24, verses 13 to 25. But as I was working with it on Friday morning, I couldn't get away with just that amount. I had to go all the way into verse 35 to make the text really speak to us this morning. So as I read at the, at the slide stop at verse 25, I'm going to keep going. So if you've got your Bibles at home or just want to follow along on, a, on a, your phone or something like that, feel free to do that. But we're going to get the whole Emmaus story with our two men along with Jesus. It's quite a fascinating event. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, 
Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a, a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it with them and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and now he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We continue with our next hymn, Abide, O Dearest Jesus, hymnal 919.
God's grace and mercy and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who grants us the forgiveness of all of our sins. We're so glad that we're able to bring God's word to you today and I hope that it's working out through the internet this morning and going well and connecting so that you can be uplifted and encouraged in the great Easter message that Jesus Christ has for you. As I said, our text is going to come to us from this great text of these two men on the road to Emmaus and suddenly this man appears... They have no idea who he is. Then when they do find out who he is, he vanishes just as quickly as he came. So let's let this word speak to us today as we move along. But for us to really understand this, we need to understand the concepts of the pre-resurrection status of the people. These two men on the road to Emmaus, it is confessed that they are deeply saddened. Their hearts were forlorn. For now, this is the third day that all these things have happened to Jesus, and we have no word on anything. For the ladies on Easter morning at the tomb, they were grieved deeply, having to bring their spices to take care of their loved one that is now gone. Their hearts were in mourning and loss. We heard last week of the disciples that they were in fear. And then until suddenly, Jesus comes on to the appearance of them and moves fear into peace. He moved the grief of the ladies into joy. He's going to move the sadness of these two men on the road to Emmaus into a great, inspiring connection to the gospel. The resurrection of Jesus changes lives. It's always designed to move us from what the world wants to make us to be into who God has made us to be. It moves us from being people of grief into being more than conquerors. Death, where is your sting? It moves us from people who live in fear and anxiety and stress into people of peace that connect with others in kindness and love and encouragement. It moves us to be people saddened like these two men on Emmaus that are forlorn and heartbroken into people who are inspired by God's word with a great faith in Jesus Christ. This whole section of these two men on the road to Emmaus is a synopsis. It's a a good review of the entire book of Luke. So it stands together as a recap. Kind of like John 3.16 is this gospel in a nutshell that gives us the whole thing of the Bible in one little verse. In Luke, we get the whole connection of the book of Luke in this part of Scripture, in Luke 24, 13 to 35, because just as Jesus appeared in Bethlehem in Luke 2, he suddenly appears on the road. And people are discovering, now, who is this Jesus? What what is he all about? And Jesus tells us, just like he did on the road. And Jesus connects to them all of who he is through Scripture and connects it to his Easter resurrection. So what happens is that Jesus is giving these two men the proper understanding of his whole life, his whole passion narrative, and the power of his resurrection, not unlike what Jesus does with all of us. To give us that proper understanding of who this Jesus is, where he is, and what he's about, and his connection to the resurrection. For if there is no Easter resurrection, all this other stuff falls short. And just becomes something pretty marginable, marginal in the life of anyone. But when we connect this proper understanding to who Jesus is, to his life coming from the dead, the condemnation and crucifixion that the world has in store for him, we move from unbelief to belief. And so what happens to these two men and so many, many others is that they get given to them by Jesus himself their faith in Christ. Now we talk about being a faith-based nation, a faith-based history, and we got faith all over the place. You can put faith in certain government officials. You can put your faith in the weatherman. You can put your faith in your automobile working. You can put your faith in all kinds of things. But none of them connect you to God the Father Almighty, other than faith in Christ. Everything else is going to leave you hanging. It's going to cause you to fall short. It's going to leave you to be sad. It's going to be leaving you to be grieved. It's going to make you live in fear. 
faith in Christ pulls you out all of those pre-Easter thinkings or philosophies and changes it with the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your heart. I want to introduce you to a little boy. His name is Creed. He lives in Florida. He was born in the Miami area, but he was born with this problem in his eyes, a situation that is going to cause him every day of his life, he's going to come closer and closer to being blind, and eventually he will be blinded like many others who have this gene defect in his DNA. And as he grew, they discovered it about year two of his life. Could not do a whole lot about it, and they're discovering this new th thing called gene therapy, where they would take Creed, if he would pass all the right tests and whatnot, and they would take a needle the size of a piece of hair, and in that needle would be billions and billions of viruses kind of a weird word right now to use, but they'd be filled with these viruses that would be connected with the good genes. And these viruses would be plopped into his eyes. And there, they would bring the good genes to replace the bad ones and to see how that would work. And as that hour-long surgery was overcome and they were able to uh, get him back up and going, they started to work in a good way. He moved from not being able to see to being able to see. In fact, in his life, his eyes got so bad that even to open up his lunchbox to eat anything in his lunchbox, he had to have a huge light shining on it so he could see anything in his lunchbox. For him to navigate from room to room, he needed to have bright lights in front of him so they would reflect back any possible images. He was now moving in a very slow way, but yet pretty quickly considering his situation to be able to see in a good way. The disciples on that road to Emmaus, they were not physically blind. They were just wondering, what is this all about? And their sight was also going to be revealed to them in a beautiful process. So Jesus is walking along with these two guys and he suddenly appears with them. They have no idea who he is because he's holding back their sight, not allowing them to see just yet. And he questions them, well, what things are you talking about? And the two men are a little bit bewildered. Are you the only visitor coming out of Jerusalem right now that doesn't know all that went down? Well, what things are you talking about? Well, the man of Nazareth. He, this man of Nazareth who, who is doing these great and wonderful things in the presence of God and all the people that our own, fear, our own Jewish leaders and priests put, condemned him and put him to death by crucifixion. And furthermore, we are hoping that he would be the one that would redeem the people. So they tried to explain who this Jesus was. They have made three major points. The first one is they said that he's Jesus of Nazareth. He's a man that, that has come from Nazareth. We know about him. We, we can figure this all out. And there it is. A second point that they made is that he was a prophet of, of great deed and word. He came and he spoke and he did these wonderful things. He was a mighty prophet. God was with him and he was able to do things that no one else could do and he backed it up with a strong word. He did great and wonderful miracles such as walking on water, calming the storms, feeding the 5,000, we know them very well, and he backed them up with his words that he was the son of God, that he could forgive sins and he is a strong and mighty person from God. This man of Nazareth is God's word and deed amongst us. In fact, that was their third point, is that in the presence of God and all the people, he was able to do all these things. It wasn't hidden. He did it for the poor. He did it for the rich. He, poor, he did it for the tax collectors. He, he did it for those who were a prominent station in life as well. He made himself in the presence of God and all the people. So they're explaining this all to Jesus. And then they kind of get to that spot, well, but our own people had him condemned and crucified. But we were hoping, we were hoping that he would be the redeemer for Israel, the one that would come and fulfill all that has been said in the Messiah. That was our hope. So what Jesus does next is that he gives them 
the best catechism class of all history. Maybe you remember your catechism class, or maybe your graduation. This, um, I got a picture of a catechism class here. I think this is in Ontario, Canada, actually, where this picture comes from, in the year about 1950 or 55, somewhere in there. If you remember maybe your confirmation classes, maybe they were on Saturday morning, Sunday morning, Wednesday nights, for maybe one year, two years, three years, or many, many hours. But Jesus went into this catechism class with these two disciples, and he explained to them all of what Scripture taught about him. Going back to the Old Testament and then showing Jesus all the way through it until the very death and resurrection of Jesus of how he is the one that they were truly hoping for. His whole conversation then ended with that concept that he is risen. It had been three days since the crucifixion. Now he's been starting these appearances, and now on the road to Emmaus, he comes and brings great faith, empowered by the resurrection of Jesus. Because he truly is risen. So he speaks with them, and he takes the scripture, he takes the gospel, and he moves them from confusion and wonderment of what's going on here into faith in Christ. Because that's what it takes. And you can have faith in a lot of different things, but unless you have faith in Christ, you're always going to be stunted. You're always going to be worried. You're always going to be wondering what's more in it for you. But faith in Christ secures your eternal walk both here and now and for an eternity. That's what the gospel does. And so these guys, their, their eyes were opened up and they see for the very first time the thrilling good news that Jesus is not dead, but he is alive. We're no longer blind, but we see. We're no longer wondering about our salvation, but now we're secure in it. Their lives were changed forever. Their eyes changed were opened to Jesus. Just not physically, but spiritually. They were now able to see one of the few people on the face of the earth that understood the resurrection of Jesus through the Holy Scriptures that changes their life to redeem Israel, not as a political faction, but as an eternal connection with God the Father, God the Creator, God the Giver of all life. Their eyes were opened to faith in Jesus Christ. No, we got to keep this very clear here because there's a lot of stuff out there that says put your faith in this. If your faith is in the pastor, you're in trouble. If your faith is in an institution, is even something like the church, you're in trouble. If your faith is in a program, if your faith is in a community, if your faith is in a connection with something that the world is offering or something that God created, you are in big trouble. Because that's empty, that's stunted. That leads to separation, that leads to, to hatred, that leads to death, that leads to frustration, it leads to anxiety, it leads to all, all kinds of mess in your being. It's going to mess you up psychologically, it's going to mess you up Physically, eventually, you die apart from Jesus. Your faith is in the same as the two men of Emmaus, it's the ladies at the grave, the disciples. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for the forgiveness of sins. If we preach anything else, we are in vain. Nothing else will do. Everything else leads you dead as a doornail. But faith in Christ opens up our eyes from God's holy word unto us. So we ask that question here in the late end of April, wherever you are, how are your eyes? Not asking you physically, but spiritually. Do you see Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life? Do you see his resurrection as conquering the grave, conquering death, conquering all things that want to make you God? but makes Christ the center of our life because he is the God who gave us the resurrection from the dead. How are your eyes? Are you focused on things that are all about you? Or are you focused on how to be Jesus in the lives of others 
because the resurrection is alive and powerful in you. Did our hearts not burn? I love that verse, verse 32 of Luke. Did our hearts not burn within us when Jesus was explaining the scriptures to us of how he fulfilled all these things to us? It was this active movement of the Holy Spirit in us that moved us to a spot where this is it. We are alive in Jesus Christ. We are now different from what the world is. We are now set apart in faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our hearts burn within us because it is true, it is alive. It is powerful and strong. It makes us be filled with joy in a world that says, be sad. It fills us with great strength in a world that says, be afraid. It fills us with great inspiration in a world that wants us to be blind to the gospel. When our hearts burn, not even the gates of hell can stop it. When our hearts burn with the resurrection, it causes impact on the lives of people. And of course, we get verse 35. When their hearts are burning, they had to go back, and there you get it, they told. No different than the shepherds, no different than the wise men, no different from the disciples in the upper room, no different from the ladies at the tomb. Here too, when your hearts burn with the power of the resurrection, when your eyes are opened up, you tell. Even in a world where you're physically distanced, you tell. We're all telling something. We're all giving a message of some sort. Let's go back to our friend Creed. It's been about three years now since he had a surgery, and they're not certain if this will all just kind of wear away over time and eventually become blind again. But so far, when I checked around, I couldn't find anything since 2019, but he was still seeing pretty well. But when he got this new vision, it changed his world so much, he would see a flower, he had to smell it. He would have to tell of all the things that affected his life now that he can see. My favorite quote from him is on the Cheerios box. He said, you know, the dot on the I in Cheerios is a Cheerio. How awesome is that? When our eyes are open, we're on this huge faith journey like these two men on the road to Emmaus. There's times we may be confused. Who is this man? What is he all about? We had hoped. We're sad. We're about this. We're in this situation in life. We're in this status. We got physical distancing. We're in lockdown. We're in all these situations of life. What's going on? Is anyone there? And Jesus says, ah, look at me through the word of God. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die, but have the light of life. Jesus has come unto us and our faith has been changed. And so we too do a little bit of telling along the way. We do the sharing. We do the encouraging. We do the building. We take people and we raise them up in God's love and we brush them off all the dust of the world and like a, a renewing of their minds, the raising them up with strength and power, the washing of them in the, the water of holy baptism, raising them up to new parts of ever before. This is the whole thing of the resurrection. Our hearts burn within us because our eyes are open. We no longer look at what the dark has to offer, but we see who Jesus is in us, and now we impact the lives of others. We're no longer putting our feet up. Please wash my foot in a way that makes me comfortable. Now we are the church that are alive in Jesus Christ. Our eyes are open. Our hearts are burning. We do the ministry. We do the foot washing. We are the ones that carry love and care to the next person in the midst of a world in which sin runs crazy for thousands and thousands of years. One of the things in my Bible reading just the other day is one of these kings of the Old Testament perished and died and was buried. And it was said of the people, no one was concerned. No one cared that the king had died. He was such a mean, honorary cuss. But now, in the light of Jesus Christ, he is concerned. 
And so he comes to each of us on our own journey, and he opens up God's word to us so that we have faith in him, that we too, on this faith journey, are alive in Jesus Christ, and our hearts, our eyes, and lives are open. Our hearts, our minds, and our hands, they burn with the gospel of Jesus Christ because of its power and strength. And so we too go and tell whoever it may be in our lives. Christ has come and placed his hand upon us. He's opened our eyes and put fire in our hearts. And he says, let's celebrate who Jesus is. And the church has been doing it, and it's doing it now in great ways. Thank all of you out there who are hearing and connecting into the lives of other people because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Anything else is counterfeit and will run dry. Your faith in Jesus Christ keeps it moving and going and alive. You belong to Jesus. In his name, amen. The peace that passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds focused on Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. We continue with our confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the hymn of response, O God of God, O Light of Light, Lutheran Service Book 810. Let us pray. You've heard our pleas for mercy, O Lord, and given up your Son to be our Savior. Hear us now as we come to you on behalf of ourselves and all people according to their needs. Our hearts have burned in us, O Lord, as your word has been read and preached. Keep our faith from growing cold and grant us grace that we may not waver in faith or succumb to temptation. Give to us and to our children receptive hearts that we may hear and hearing believe, and believing be steadfast in the faith and hope all of our days. You have cleansed us, O Lord, with water and the word and baptism, and you have marked us as your own people. Give to us grace that we may live out this faith in holy lives, lifting up your name 
in word and works for as long as we live. Guide us that with souls purified by obedience to the truth, we may love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Bless your church, O oh Lord, that she may welcome the stranger in Christ's name and manifest the unity of faith in the bonds of love. Gather together those who are separated and preserve their faith by your word until the precautions and shelter measures have passed. Bless those training for your church work vocations. Bless each of us as we live out our baptismal vocation of worship, witness, prayer, and service. Guard our nation, O oh Lord, that we may enjoy peace and security in the face of threat and danger. Bless our president, Congress, governor, and all state and local officials that they fulfill their, their offices faithfully. Bless them in times of making very hard decisions. Bless all emergency and medical workers and the members of the armed forces who protect us and teach the nations the ways of peace. Bless all those who are serving, taking care of those whose positions are essential in the lives of people who are ill or providing the sustenance of life in different circumstances. Deliver us from all afflictions and, and guide our, us and, that we can bear all of our burdens, O oh Lord. Hear us in particular as we pray for those that call upon us, including Celeste and Kristen, and Walter and Linda and Neil and Luther and Ruth, Suzanne, Judy and Karen, Anita, Levi, Lloyd, and Jane. Lord, be with all of your people according to your strength, your power, and your will. According to your gracious will, heal the sick, relieve those who suffer, comfort the grieving, and give peace to the dying. Stay with us, O Lord, and be our strength and weakness and our hope in time of despair. Your gracious will once kept the saints in faith, even until death. Keep us, we pray, with them, in your faith and fear that we may be found faithful when Christ comes again in his glory to bring fulfillment to all things once and forevermore. Forgive our sins, strengthen our faith, build up our unity as a congregation and synod and church throughout the world. Equip us to love and to serve one another as you have loved and served us. Accept, O Lord, the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving we bring for all your goodness and generosity. And with our song of praise, accept our tithes and offerings that your church may have the resources to proclaim your gospel and care for the poor and those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These and whatever things we need, O oh Lord, we pray you to grant us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose death has made full atonement for our sin and whose resurrection has granted to us the promise of our own joyful resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we continue with our offering, we celebrate the good news that Christ has offered himself to us, and we respond back with our own offering. I again thank all of you connected with Lakeside Lutheran Church for your wonderful offerings and gifts. Again, last Sunday we matched just about exactly what we had a year ago, just through the mail. People dropping off their offerings to the church office or however you may be doing it. We're so thankful that you have Jesus and your response is giving, thanksgiving, and praise. The Lord bless us always as we offer ourselves to Christ. Amen.
now as we receive our benediction, in just a little bit, we're going to be also singing the song, Abide With Me. And in that hymn, we see that God always walks with us. He abides with us in whatever our life circumstances are. These days, we may feel a little bit lonely. And that may really cut us to boredom, cut us to wondering, and cause our brain to go in lots of different directions. But as we look at the words of this hymn, Abide in Me, Christ abides with us, God abides with us, the Holy Spirit abides with us. He does not send us on a mission and watch to see how well we do. He is with us along the way, guiding us, loving us, serving us, empowering us, holding us, encouraging us every step of the way. He abides with us and we with him. Every day for now and eternity, we have our faith in Christ. He has opened our eyes. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.